Rising temperatures and heat waves are making life almost unbearable in most cities. So we do ask, is there a way we can build sustainably and also keep people comfortable too? More on that in this edition of Eco Africa, your weekly environment magazine. My name is Sandra Tuinovidio. Hi Sandra, nice to see you and hello to all of you viewers out there. I am Chris Elems. As Sandra said, our planet is getting hotter and that means we're going to have to make changes to the way we do all sorts of things. Here's a quick look at what's in store on the program. How insects could help mitigate malnutrition in Madagascar. And why many fishing nets in Tunisia are coming up empty. We'll begin in Cameroon where we meet a young man who's very concerned about the impact climate change is having on his hometown and the world. So much so that he was motivated to action. And what started as a bit of fun has now become much more than just a hobby. Before getting to work, these kids have to wash their project supplies which is a bit out of the ordinary. They're taking part in a workshop run by 17-year-old Arsene Dongmo. Everything here is made from trash. The children will learn how to design and build their own model city out of waste. We're building a model of the city of tomorrow with trees and renewable energy to combat global warming. It all started with an early passion for building. Arsène was unhappy at a traditional school, so his parents sent him to a technical school instead. He started to develop ideas there, to do drawings. He built little things out of stuff like cardboard. Gradually, he got to the level he's at today. He had a talent, and as a mother, I wanted to encourage him to develop it. He's now gaining a following online. He gives most of his models away, but some he sells. This stadium was quickly snapped up. I didn't just buy it for myself. I also bought it so that I could advertise for him. If someone wants something built and they see this model and ask who built it, I'll tell them it's the design of a talented young architect. Dongo finds enough material where he lives in Yaoundé, the capital of Cameroon. He goes to businesses and homes to collect trash, especially cardboard and plastic. He's helped to raise awareness about recycling. We didn't recycle before, but us and Dongmo's initiative taught us how to systematically separate out trash. There's a local sanitation company, but it can only process limited amounts. Only about 40% of the trash gets collected. The trucks only drive on big paved streets, but most residents live along small roads. When you walk through the city, you see garbage all over the place. People just throw it anywhere. Every community needs to develop a waste disposal strategy. In the Simbok area, where Arsène lives, at least some of the trash gets picked up by him. He needs it for his weekly workshops. It's my goal to teach as many kids as possible how to build these models out of trash and how to separate trash. And the parents learn as well. Around 30 families are taking part and interest is growing. They just pay a small fee for the tools. I've seen Arsene's models and they really interest me. That's why I signed my son up so he can make them too. He started giving workshops early this year. The children pay attention to him. His models haven't only inspired a love of building, the workshops also make them more aware of their environment. Even though they're only building models of trees and solar panels, they're learning more about environmental protection and Asen Dogmo hopes to inspire even more people. 
I dream of sharing my passion with the whole world and seeing one of my models being built in full scale. Even if his dream isn't a reality yet, Arsene Dogmu is tenacious and continues to forge his own path. He's already created his green district, if only in model form. From model homes to the real thing, mega cities like Lagos, Nairobi and Joburg are groaning under the weight of population growth. Houses are springing up on almost every available space. But cement and rapid construction are not so good for the environment. How can the building industry become more sustainable? We went to Kenya to explore some potential solutions. Kenya's construction industry is booming. And these three people want to help make the sector greener. Wakina Mutembe promotes a special type of sustainable timber. Jane Wayaki launched the green makeover of a bank in Nairobi. And Ted Otieno advises companies on how to build in a way that's better for the environment. Otieno has an appointment at a new apartment building and heads straight for the roof with the project manager. Otieno works for an NGO that helps to certify new buildings according to environmental standards. The company that commissioned the project has opted for solar panels and respected other criteria for green building too. As compared to business, business as usual, if your building is doing 20% uh, better on energy, operational energy, 20% better on water, 20% better on embodied energy that has gone into the building material, um, then your building is considered a green building. As of 2021, there were 43 new certified green buildings in Kenya. That might not sound like much, but it's twice as many as there were in 2020. So there's a trend here. But what about older buildings? Can they also be made green? This branch of the Absa Bank in Nairobi's Central Business District is in a building constructed over 50 years ago. Jane Wayaki is the bank's sustainability officer. She's had the ground floor revamped to make it as green as possible. All of the bank's more than 80 branches across the country have undergone the same treatment. There are now energy-saving LED lights in all the rooms. Water dispensers instead of plastic bottles. And water-saving devices for the toilets and sinks. The conversion wasn't cheap, but it's led to enormous savings, the equivalent of more than 160,000 euros. 2021 alone, we were able to save up to 20 million shillings in terms of the annual electricity bills that we paid. And 2022 as well, using 2020 as a baseline as well, uh, by half year, we've been able to get a savings of 10 million. And there aren't just financial benefits. The bank told us that the green conversion will cut its carbon emissions for 2022 by 6,000 tons. Green refurbishing of older buildings is vital. But Kenya is also facing a housing shortage. So more new buildings are necessary. An estimated 2 million homes are needed right now. And since concrete and steel production emit a lot of greenhouse gases, new materials are needed. Materials like cross-laminated timber. Cross-laminated timber gives an opportunity for decarbonizing buildings in, in Kenya and in the world at large, really. This is because construction and building activities contribute to approximately 39% of the carbon emissions in the world. Cross-laminated timber, or CLT, is a product made by gluing layers of wood together. Panels can be created in a variety of lengths, widths, and thicknesses. Many architects view CLT as the concrete of the future. It's relatively lightweight and yet very strong and means buildings can be put up fast. It's amazingly fireproof, too. When exposed to flames for a long time, only the outside chars. Build X Studio, a social enterprise specialized in design and construction, has put up a prototype building near Nairobi with a core structure made of CLT. Unlike concrete, CLT is considered a green building material that even stores carbon dioxide. But it's only truly green if the trees that are used are replaced. When you cut down that tree, you create space for another tree to be planted that can be used in another building. And the sequestering of the carbon and storage of the carbon and the sinking of the carbon continues 
This makes buildings carbon stores, increases the amount of carbon we're sequestering from the environment, increases the amount of carbon we're storing within our buildings. Kenya's construction sector grew by 6.6% in 2021. So there's lots of potential for many more green buildings in Kenya. Those are certainly interesting projects. It would be great if more people followed their lead. Reducing carbon emissions and using energy more efficiently are crucial to protecting life on the planet, both on land and in the sea. Speaking of the sea, our next report takes us to the North African coast. You are very right, Chris. We now head to Tunisia, where fishermen are in troubled waters. Life for them is getting more and more difficult. According to an EU study, the Mediterranean Sea has seen fish stocks drop by a third over the last 50 years. The vast majority of the native species are now threatened by overfishing. Visitors entering the town of Zarzis will notice a work of art that looks more like wishful thinking than the reality on the ground. Precious few fishers in Tunisia bring in a decent catch these days. Many simply abandon their boats, and young people are leaving. Looking at the current situation, I have to say that there is no future in fishing. I can only tell young people to consider a different line of work. Biologists from the National Institute of Marine Sciences and Technology in Sfax are looking for reasons behind the dwindling fish stocks. The prime suspect? Toxic algae. We discovered that a toxic species of algae is responsible for this phenomenon. In 2019, there was a very high concentration of the algae species called Carinia brevis. In 2020, its stocks were slightly lower. But this year, they've increased again. Especially in the area around the port of Gabès. To make ends meet, fishers frequently resort to illegal methods, such as catching fish that are actually too young and small to sell, like this swordfish. At the fish market in Sfax, you'll also find cartilaginous fish, like rays and sharks which are in fact endangered and protected species. Bashir Saidi and Nidal Trabelsi are trying to reverse the trend. They want fishers to stop catching sharks and other endangered species. They're part of the project Med Bycatch, which was launched two years ago and began with extensive data collection. We've collected a lot of data, which we'll use to make proposals on how to reduce unwanted bycatch of endangered species for all of Tunisia. Nidal Trabelsi has developed a good relationship with the fishing community in the port of Zarzis. He tells them about the research results and provides insights into the concept of closed season. This is when the different species lay their eggs and can't be fished. The evaluation of the samples makes it clear that fishing in the Mediterranean must become more sustainable. One solution would be using different fishing methods. Trawling can be replaced by long lining, which involves long plastic lines with sardine baited hooks attached at around six meter intervals. Med Bycatch plans to recommend this type of fishing. With long line and hook line fishing, the fish have the choice. The fish that go for the bait get caught. The others don't. It's completely different to trawling, which basically catches everything in the sea. Preserving the ecosystem in the Mediterranean will also require more fishermen like Lassad Ben Shuika to switch to alternative methods. And not only in Zarzis, but across Tunisia and along the coasts of other countries bordering the Mediterranean Sea. From Tunisia, we cross the Mediterranean to Greece. 
Athens is one of the hottest cities in Europe and extreme temperatures are putting public health at risk. This is one reason why Europe's first chief heat officer is based there. Not long ago, we reported on the very first heat officer here in Africa. Today, we introduce you to our colleague in Europe. In high summer, the sun beats down on Athens. Temperatures of 40 degrees Celsius or more are becoming commonplace. And that's hard on tourists and locals alike. Eleni Merivili always keeps her water bottle handy. She knows all about summer in the city and the risks it poses, because she's Athens' chief heat officer. The Greek capital's first, and the first in all of Europe. It's her job to prepare the city for climate change. Here, she's descending into the city's historical underground, together with an employee of the Athens Waterworks. It's home to Hadrian's Aqueduct, an underground tunnel almost 20 kilometers long, built by Roman Emperor Hadrian in the 2nd century AD. Eleni Marivoli wants water to flow here again soon. Engineers have already drawn up plans. That they are planning to create 20 specific points where, um, where they tap into the water, into the so green new parks. The idea is to create a green belt running straight through the city. The creation of parks should produce a cooling effect. The chief heat officer is particularly proud of this small park, which was inspired by Japanese gardens. That we have to choose plants that uh, both have uh, a lot of leaves and thick canopy that, which that are... lose their, their leaves in the winter, but also can, can do not need enormous amounts of water and can survive in difficult conditions. For several years now, extreme heat waves in Greece have almost always been accompanied by forest fires, which are increasingly becoming a threat to the capital. Eleni Marivoli knows that time is running out. In a few decades, large parts of this city of close to 4 million people could become uninhabitable. Already, Athens is often the hottest city in Europe during the summer. Um, we don't have a lot of parks and, and green spaces. Um, and we have a lot of old people. The fact that the, the surfaces are, are uh, we have a lot of surfaces that tend to heat up. We have a lot of cars that produce even more heat and air conditioning produces even more heat. So it's actually a pretty deadly mix in Athens. The heat is an issue for Agis Emmanuel, and not just because he likes to run long distances. He's an actor and one of the most famous climate activists in Greece. To promote climate protection, the Athenian ran 2,500 kilometers from here to the World Climate Conference in Glasgow, Scotland last year. He thinks having a heat officer like Eleni Marivoli isn't a bad idea, but that for Athens, it's likely too little, too late. It'd be nice to have a new park in my neighborhood with a fountain I can cool off in on hot days. But to be honest, it seems like giving a cancer patient an aspirin. I get the impression that we've already surrendered. We've accepted the climate crisis, and now we're trying to somehow live with it. After all, this ancient city has survived many a crisis in its almost 4,000-year-long history. Waste management is another big challenge for many countries, and that is true here in Africa too. But as we'll see in this week's Doing a Beat series, education can play a big role in terms of effecting change. After all, even something as simple as an old plastic bottle can have many uses. It's time to go in. These school kids in Togo's capital of Lomé have been looking forward to their outing to Magique Parc Ecologique, a very unique education center. All of the buildings here, along with the pavement, were constructed using waste materials. I love this place because things that I thought were useless are actually useful. 
I think recycling is important and everyone should do more of it. From now on, when I see trash, I'll collect it and bring it here. In Togo, more than two million tons of plastic waste end up in the environment each year, according to official figures. Even though the country does have waste management centers, the recycling rate remains low. That's why raising awareness of the problem is critical. This is important because children learn that instead of throwing everything in the trash, they can turn some things into other useful objects, things that have a purpose. But the center does more than make use of plastic bottles and rubber tires. The Magique Parc Ecologique also has a biodigester. Here, young people can see how organic waste is turned into combustible biogas. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. Here on Eco Africa, we frequently address the issue of food security. More and more people around the world are in desperate need of adequate nutrition. But practices like livestock farming use up a lot of resources like water and arable land. So how can we reduce our meat consumption and still get enough protein? Well, Sandra, insects are an option that's been creating a lot of buzz in recent years. Let's take a look at what people are cooking up at a farm in Madagascar. Just consider it a little taste of things to come. Some people find bugs on a plate unappetizing, but these crickets are being bred by the thousands in Valala Farm Laboratory at the Madagascar Biodiversity Center. Rich in protein, the insects are meant to play a key role in feeding the country. Now, we are expanding and improving our products and we are finding ways to acquire the necessary materials so that we can further increase our production. This will be our contribution to fighting malnutrition in Madagascar. More and more forest is being cleared to grow food. Madagascar has lost a significant amount of its forest cover in recent decades. Some tropical wood is exported, but over half is used for cooking. Many farmers also burn sections of the forest to create new fields. Then there's climate change, which is also causing problems for farmers. Rainforest soil is known to be poor, but extreme weather and erosion are further degrading the land. This, coupled with increasing drought, is leading to more and more crop failures. This is where the newly founded insect processing facility comes in. Here, different edible powders are produced from dried crickets and worms with the aim of bringing insect protein onto the food market. We know that people have their preferences. For example, in the north, some insects are more popular than meat. Our role is to ensure that insects are always available and in sufficient quantities. The manufacturers believe they can produce enough powder for about half a million meals a year. Keeping and processing the insects is simple and environmentally friendly. And their excrement is also used to produce natural fertilizer for agriculture. We are trying to vary the insect fertilizers for use with coffee plants, cloves and cinnamon. We are also launching into agroforestry, where we cultivate trees. We use organic fertilizer because we know very well that we cannot use chemical fertilizers in protected primary forests. Dried and roasted insects are already popular dishes in some African countries. This pop-up restaurant in Cape Town, South Africa, for example, only serves insect dishes, considered both nutritious and delicious. Freshly fried crickets or worms sell like hotcakes here. 
nutritious and delicious. What more do you want? That's all for today. We hope you enjoyed the program. And do be sure to join us again next week. Until then, it's goodbye from me in Ogun State, Nigeria. Take care. It is also goodbye from me here in Kampala. But don't forget to check in with us on all our social media platforms or even our website. There you can find all our shows and reports as well as other interesting content that I'm sure will be helpful for you. So see you next week, same time, same place for Eco Africa. Bye-bye.